Send your scariest workplace stories to us at eeriecast.com, comma, submit, rate, and review tales from the break room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? McDonald's is one of those places where every mile there's another one. You can't drive for long before you see those golden arches, and you can smell those weird but oddly tasty burgers from inside your car. Luckily, we don't have one near dead and roasted anymore after those clown sightings a few years back. The locals kind of, well, rioted and set fire to the McDonald's, all because the Ronald McDonald statue creeped them out. I kind of miss it. Anyway, today's stories are all about McDonald's and some very disturbing things that allegedly happened there. Take these stories with a grain of salt, get it? But prepare for violent attacks, mysterious creatures, and downright life-ruining discoveries. These are tales from the break room. It attacked me from Garner. I don't think I'll ever forget those two nights working the graveyard shift at a McDonald's in Maine. I won't say exactly where for the sake of privacy. It was back in 2009, my junior year of high school. I was working part-time as a cashier to save up for a car. The overnight crew was small, just me, the manager Reggie, and one line cook named Steve. The place was kept open 24 sevenths since we got a good bit of business from truckers and late night partiers. One of my duties was cleaning the bathrooms at the start and end of my shift. Being the only girl, I usually just tidied up the women's room. But that particular night, Steve was swamped on the line and Reggie asked me to take care of the men's room too. Now, our men's room was just this tiny closet of a space, a single toilet and a sink. I didn't think much of it at first. I grabbed the mop bucket and went in to clean. I had my back to the door, scrubbing the toilet. When clear as day, I heard a voice right behind me, a masculine one. It said, don't turn around. I froze, my heart racing. That voice was low and rough, nearly a growl. There was no one else in the room with me. I was sure of it. I would have had to squeeze past them to even get to the toilet. Should I run out the door, turn and confront whoever this was? Before I could decide, I heard the creak of the bathroom door opening. I whipped around, expecting to see some freak sneaking up on me. But no, no one was there. I told Reggie what happened, and he checked our security tapes. But of course, they showed Zilch. He offered to finish cleaning the men's room for me. No way was I going back in there. I didn't scare easy, but that voice was way too real. Almost like the person was standing right behind me. I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Reggie teased me for weeks about the bathroom ghost, but I knew what I heard. As creepy as that was, things got way worse a couple of weeks later. This brings me to the second night in question. It was another slow night around 2 a.m. Steve had gone home sick, so it was just me and Reggie. As I restocked the napkins, Reggie asked if I'd grab some more burger patties from the freezer. I was happy to get away from boredom, so I snagged up my jacket and headed to the back. The freezer was basically a giant walk-in fridge that we kept meat and produce in. I stepped inside fumbling for the light switch, instantly hit by a blast of cold air. I went looking for the burger patties when the heavy metal door suddenly slammed shut behind me. I jumped, confused as to how the door had shut. I tried the interior handle, and I realized there was something wrong. Someone, something was holding that door shut tight. I pounded on the door and yelled out. Reggie must not have heard me over the kitchen noise. It was so cold. My breath was fogging. It was then that I felt it. A powerful, unseen pressure 
shoved me hard against the wall, nearly crushing my windpipe. I clawed at my neck, but I didn't feel anything there, not with my hands or fingers. And yet, something was pushing against my throat, like a pair of icy hands strangling the life out of me. Before long, spots swam before my eyes. I was certain then I was going to die alone in that freezer. Suddenly, the pressure let up. Just as Reggie threw open the freezer door, eyes wide with alarm, I stumbled out, choking and sputtering. Reggie steadied me, demanding to know what happened. Through chattering teeth, I gasped outside something along the lines of... It choked me. Something had attacked me, but one look at his face told me he didn't believe it. He searched the freezer himself, then looked around the restaurant, but there was no one there but us. However, Reggie made me sit in his office, sipping hot tea until my parents came to get me. I quit the next day, and I told everyone I got a better gig hostessing at the diner downtown. Truthfully, I was terrified of setting foot back inside that Mickey D's. Something sinister lurked there that none of us could explain. And it clearly had a bone to pick with the overnight staff, particularly me. I still have to drive past that McDonald's sometimes late at night for my current job. The glow of the sign draws my attention like a beacon through the dark and I always peer into the shadows of the parking lot, half expecting to glimpse the dark figure who spoke to me. Other times, I imagine the freezer door swinging slowly open, the icy, unseen force beckoning me, reminding me that I know what's out there when no one else does. I'm scared it's just waiting for someone else unlucky enough to wander into its grasp in those small, eerie hours between midnight and dawn. To McDonald's scares from Tragic Toby. I have two stories for you today. The first one takes place in 2022 in a small city in Arkansas, located about an hour north from Little Rock. I had just moved to Arkansas in March of 2022 with my fiance. My brother-in-law, Tob, had some connections at a McDonald's there, where he said he could possibly get me a management job, since I had previously worked for a McDonald's two years ago, and was on the line to becoming a manager at the other store before I left. After I completed the interview, I became a manager, and it wasn't long before I would start running shifts with other managers, or on my own when I closed. This story happened around 5 p.m., just before I was supposed to clock out and go home. The manager on duty with me that night's closing manager was Little Andrew. We called him Little Andrew because we had someone else named Andrew, and he was six feet tall and 270 pounds, whereas Little Andrew was about 5'3 and 190 pounds. Anyway, Little Andrew was there as well, it was an hour or two before I was supposed to clock out when a customer came through the drive through He ordered a large fry, remember that for later, as well as a double quarter pounder with cheese and a select few items. As he pulled up to the window, he was a very average guy. He was nice to our employees and didn't even put up a fight when we asked him to pull into a spot where he could wait for his fries to cook which, in itself, is usually rare, since people get very mad when that happens. So after we ran out his food and he came back in, all was well. But before long, about an hour and a half later, little Andrew gets a call and goes into the back office where we counted the money so we could hear better. I followed him since I was still learning how to properly answer the phone what to do when certain types of people call about certain things. The phone call was going well, until 
until the person on the other line said something that made little Andrew scream into the phone. Now, let me remind you that little Andrew is similar to me in the sense that neither of us like confrontation with angered people, nor do we yell unless it's absolutely necessary. So when he screamed into the phone, hey, you don't talk about my employees like that or I'll have you arrested. That's sick. Well, I had to ask what happened. He explained that the person who called said they had come through a while before and ordered two large fries, a double quarter pounder, and a few other things. According to little Andrew, they had said that our employee working the front window had been incredibly rude and refused to give them the fry he was missing, which he allegedly ordered. He then proceeded to tell little Andrew that he was going to drag the aforementioned employee through the window, beat her to a bloody pulp, and leave her for dead in our drive through Obviously pretty shaken, I was confused, wondering about every side of the story. So I went up front to ask the employee her side. She pulled up his receipt, which only listed one large fry. She was extremely nice and had let the man know that he had only ordered one large fry. She claims after that, the man simply smiled and drove off. Hours later, I was walking out the door to wait for my ride home when a car sped into the parking lot. I immediately had a feeling that this was the guy who had called earlier. Right away, I pulled out my phone, pressing record on the camera, discreetly pointing it at little Andrew and the man who now stood in front of the counter, screaming at little Andrew. Little Andrew had his arms crossed after he noticed me recording and watching. He looked at me and simply said, call Andrew meaning the other manager. I did so and told Andrew what was going on, mentioning we needed some help or advice. He told me to calmly wait for the police to get there, as one of my co-workers had called them while the confrontation was happening. Eventually, the police came, and everyone who was near or witness to the situation had to give a statement. The guy was driven to the station for questioning, now, that one may not be very scary, but the next one truly scared me enough to have me call my fiance and mother to tell them that I loved them. This story happened around May of 2021, a few months after I started working at McDonald's for the very first time. That night, we had three people closing. Me, my friend D, and my manager C. Another important person in the story is KK was in an abusive relationship and was beginning to get in a relationship with C so she could escape the abusive one. She was also supposed to be closing with us, but she had called in and said she wouldn't be able to come in because she was in a holding cell at the jail for fighting back against her boyfriend. A little note to add, is that Kay and her abusive boyfriend shared a car and he didn't go to jail for hitting her since she was the only one that made a mark. For two weeks leading up to what I'm going to tell you, the abusive boyfriend had been hacking into C's messenger to send messages to the work group chat, saying things like, I'm a stupid S word, I'm such a big P word, and things like that, as well as threats like he's going to come shoot up the store, saving SC for last, and other such things, but he never followed up on them. So we decided to just let it be, removing both K and C from the chat, so nothing else happened. The night we closed, it was about an hour and a half until 11 p.m., so about 9.30 p.m., I was cleaning my stuff early when I saw Kay's car pull into the drive through When I realized she said she wouldn't come in that day, my heart sank. 
I ran to the back to see, asking him to clarify if Kay was still in jail, not coming in, and if her boyfriend had her car. He said yes. My heart sank even further when he asked why. I had to explain that I just saw their car pull in, meaning something we did not want to believe. He was here. His threats could be coming true. Upon hearing this, C grabbed D and me, rushing us to the crew room in the back of the store. He took off his work shirt, telling us to stay put and stay quiet. He told us, if I don't come back in 10 minutes, call the police. This is where the fear really set in. I called my fiance and my mother, apologizing for everything I'd ever done and telling them I loved them as I cried. They did the same. After about five minutes, he came. Back, Kay in his arms, explaining they had let her go because someone paid her bail. I was so grateful nothing happened and that I'm still alive to this day, but something inside me still wonders what would have happened if it was him. Would I have been able to escape out the back door with D? Or would I have died that night? Warning. The following story contains depictions of harm against children. The disturbing stranger's gift from Messy Bethany. I was working the late shift at a McDonald's back in 2017. I'll say it was in Oklahoma, but I won't say exactly where. It was around 11 at night, and the usual slow buzz of the restaurant had settled in. You know, the quiet hum of the fryer, the occasional beep from the cash register, nothing out of the ordinary. I was at the front counter dealing with the occasional customer who wandered in for a late night snack. The place was almost empty, just a few lingering souls scattered about, munching on fries or sipping soda. That's when it happened. This strange guy walks in, wearing an old, worn-out overcoat. It wasn't exactly cold outside, but I guess people had their reasons to dress the way they do. He just strolls in, doesn't even bother looking at the menu. I'm thinking maybe he's waiting for someone, so I give him a happy nod and get back to taking orders. But the guy just goes straight for one of the booths and sits down. Now, it's not unusual for folks to hang out, maybe wait for a friend or enjoy the free Wi-Fi, but something about the guy seemed very off. As I continue serving customers, or cleaning the front counter. I notice he's been sitting there for a good hour, still not ordering a thing. My curiosity is piqued, so I glance over at him. He's just staring into space like he's in some sort of trance. That's when one of my coworkers, the one that had been cleaning the lobby, comes rushing over, looking all wide-eyed and spooked. He leans in and whispers, guy in the booth. He's got something under his coat, and I swear there's blood on it. Now, I'm not one to jump to conclusions, but that's not the kind of news you want to hear when you're stuck behind a cash register at McDonald's. I look back over at the strange guy, trying to take a closer look. Sure enough, I think I can see it. A weird bulge under his coat. Our manager catches wind of the situation and decides to handle it. She walks over, trying to be subtle about it, and asks if everything's okay. But this man doesn't even acknowledge. Instead, he just gets up and leaves, not saying a word to the manager. At this point, I'm thinking, maybe he's just a bit off, you know, mentally troubled or something. But the story doesn't end there. The guy walks through the exit, goes through the parking lot, then sort of stops, looks around, and heads right over to one of my co-worker's cars. The guy reaches into his coat, and I can see him leaving something through the open window of that car. My co-worker, who's still cleaning the lobby, notices it too. He mutters something like, 
Are you kidding me? Why my car? The manager, sensing something fishy, dials the police while we all keep an eye on the guy from the window. The tension in the air is palpable. The manager warns the co-worker not to go out, but he's having none of it. The strange guy leaves, and the co-worker who owns the car bolts right outside to see what the strange man had left there. We're all watching him from inside as he leans into his car. It doesn't take long for him to react. His eyes widen, and he clutches his mouth, stepping back in shock. He half stumbles, half runs back into the restaurant, looking pale as a ghost. The manager is on the phone with the police, and my co-worker is practically hyperventilating as he tells us what he found. He, he left a baby in my car, man. A freaking baby. It's dead now. You can imagine the chaos that followed. The manager was telling this all to the police, trying to give them as much information as possible. Could say that it stared at me too, because it had stopped what it was doing, keeping its head turned towards me. Finally, I got my wits about me. I dropped the trash bag I was carrying and booked it back inside, nearly bowling over Tanya as I burst through the door. I was panting and probably white as a sheet, and Tanya immediately asked me what was wrong. I stammered out something about a bear, but she just gave me a skeptical look. Jamie, who had been wiping down the tables, overheard our conversation and came over to see what the commotion was about. I managed to calm down enough to tell them what I saw, and they exchanged worried glances. Jamie suggested we call the police, but Tanya hesitated. She didn't want to cause a fuss over nothing, especially if it was just a wild animal. In the end, we decided to keep an eye out and only call the police if we saw it again or if it got too close. The rest of the night passed without incident, but I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. I kept glancing out the windows half expecting to see that thing lurking in the shadows. When dawn finally broke and our shift ended, I practically ran to my car, eager to get home and put the whole ordeal behind me. However, as the days went by, it became clear that whatever I had seen behind the McDonald's wasn't going away. Other employees started reporting strange sightings and encounters. Some claimed to have seen the creature lurking in the parking lot late at night, while others reported hearing strange noises coming from the dumpster area. We tried to brush it off as wild imagination or a prankster playing tricks on us, but deep down, we knew something wasn't right. The atmosphere at work became tense and morale plummeted. No one wanted to work the late shift anymore and customers started avoiding the restaurant altogether. Despite our best efforts to ignore it, the presence of that thing behind the McDonald's continued to haunt us. It seemed to feed off our fear and anxiety, growing bolder with each passing night. Eventually, the situation became unbearable, and the franchise owner was forced to take action. We never found out what happened to the creature behind the McDonald's, but after a series of late night stakeouts and investigations, it mysteriously disappeared without a trace. To this day, I can't help but wonder what it was and where it came from. Was it some kind of mutant or a lost soul condemned to wander the earth? I guess we'll never know for sure its way through. We didn't dare look out the window, afraid of what we might see. After what felt like an eternity, we cautiously peeked out, but the creature was gone. We locked up quickly and practically ran to our cars, not daring to linger a moment longer than necessary. The next day, 
we agreed to tell Tanya about what we saw. We couldn't keep it to ourselves any longer. Not after what happened the night before. Surprisingly, Tanya took it more seriously this time. She still didn't want to involve the police, fearing it would draw unwanted attention to the restaurant. But she agreed to beef up security around the building. We installed extra lights in the parking lot, as well as security cameras to monitor the area. We also made sure to always have at least two people on duty during the late shift, just in case. Despite our efforts, the sightings of the creature continued, though they became less frequent over time. After a few months, things finally seemed to calm down. The creature stopped appearing altogether, and life at the McDonald's returned to normal. We never did find out what the creature was, or where it came from, but I'm grateful that we never had to encounter it again. To this day, I still can't shake the memory of that night behind the McDonald's. It's a reminder that sometimes, the things we fear the most are the things we can't explain. Thank you for joining us on this eerie journey through the tales from the break room. We hope these spine-chilling stories have left you with a sense of intrigue and excitement. Remember, the darkness holds many secrets. Sometimes, the scariest stories are the ones that happen in the most unexpected places, even at work. If you have a terrifying tale of your own to share, don't hesitate to submit it to us at eeriecast.com. Remember, starting April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for approved stories featured on the show. However, Submission does not guarantee approval or payment, so make sure your story is truly bone-chilling. Make sure to follow and rate Tales from The Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to explore our other horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com. Until next time, stay vigilant. And may your late night shifts be free from any otherworldly encounters. Good night and pleasant nightmares.